Hi, and welcome to our session today, Neurologic Conditions with a Focus on Cerebral Palsy. My name is Kendra Ganyan. I am a pediatric physical therapist and a professor of physical therapy. So we're going to focus on CP as sort of our um, example of a neurologic condition because it's really one of the most common conditions that is seen in PT practice. And so our objectives for today, um, we're going to describe how CP is defined, diagnosed, and classified. Identify common impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions associated with CP. Discuss how the gross motor function classification system can be used to provide a prognosis for children with CP. And finally, describe some basic principles of physical therapy management of CP for children in infancy, preschool, school age, and adolescence. So what is cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy is defined as a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture, causing activity limitations that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that CP is a, some sort of damage that happens to the brain either before, during, or immediately after birth. Um, the causes of CP aren't completely understood. Um, it is associated with prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal events such as hypoxic, um, ischemic, infectious, congenital, or traumatic brain insults. So a lot of times we hear about, you know, babies who are born prematurely, and so they may have a, um, because of that really fragile vasculature in the brain, they have a brain bleed, and so that's essentially um, a, a, a creates some damage to the brain right after birth. There's some thinking that some children may experience some hypoxic events um, before birth, so in utero. Some children experience a traumatic birth and a hypoxic event during birth. And then sometimes there are things that happen immediately after. And so there's not necessarily consensus of how long after birth a brain injury occurs to be considered cerebral palsy versus a traumatic brain injury. Um, some sources say up to age five years. But um, in general, when a brain injury occurs in a young child, um, they, even, they, they present as, as cerebral palsy. What's important to remember about cerebral palsy, however, is that it is a brain injury that occurs. Um, it's the, the injury itself is not progressive. Once the event occurs, the injury to the brain is there. So unless another event occurs, it's not progressive. Now, that's not to say that if not properly managed that an individual can't um, experience, you know, a loss of skills, but that isn't because the brain injury itself has progressed. It's because of kind of other factors. So how is it diagnosed? Um, a clinical diagnosis of CP is made when a child does not reach their early motor milestones, and they also exhibit abnormal muscle tone or some qualitative differences in movement patterns. And so even when a child experiences a known brain injury or hypoxic event at birth, the reality is, is the brain is extremely plastic, um, extremely adaptable, and some of these children do not experience long-term um, effects and aren't diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Similarly, there are children who are diagnosed with cerebral palsy where the brain event at birth is unknown, and we kind of look back and think, well, something must have happened um, in utero or something that we, we didn't um, discern. So it's not something that a diagnosis that occurs immediately um, even in children who are at, uh, who have an injury that we know is very high risk for CP, we usually sort of watch them over time, and um, often a diagnosis isn't made until 18 months to two years. Now, there's definitely a movement in the profession and uh, to try to diagnose children earlier, um, but at this point, it's still there's still a lot of um, physicians that are uh, reluctant to diagnose CP before age one especially because um, of the idea that, you know, sometimes it takes some months for the neurological, those transient neurological symptoms to move on. So how do we classify cerebral palsy? Now, traditionally, we classify cerebral palsy by impaired area of the body or the movement abnormality. Contemporary um, classification of cerebral palsy is done through the GMFCS um, which there's a version now called the GMFCS ER, which means uh, um, extended and revised. And I've got a link here for you to that um, resource. It's available for free um, online at the CanChild website. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more here in a few slides. 
So going back to kind of traditional classification of cerebral palsy, um, traditionally we talk about cerebral palsy by impaired area of the body. So monoplegia is when one limb is involved. Um, diaplegia is when all four limbs are involved, but the legs are more involved than the arms. Hemiplegia is when one side is more involved than the other, so the right or the left side. And quadriplegia is when all four limbs are involved. So diaplegia and quadriplegia are sort of on a continuum because both of those, all four limbs are involved, but in diaplegia, the arms or the legs are much more effective and the arms actually have quite a bit of function, whereas in quadriplegia, there's a pretty major loss of function in arms and legs. And then by movement abnormality, um, we have spastic, um, we refer to CP as spastic, and that's usually when there's a, um, some sort of an injury to the white matter tracts that result in that high tone, right? Um, a dyskinetic or athetoid cerebral palsy is usually results from injury to the basal ganglia. Ataxic cerebral palsy usually refers to an injury to the cerebellum. And hypo or hypotonic cerebral palsy, or kind of low tone floppy, um, it's, there's not a specific area of the brain that seems to be associated with that, but that is just that kind of, um, when a child is just kind of floppy, kind of ragdoll sort of tone. And there is, it's, that's a more rare form of CP, um, but it is seen occasionally. So the most common spastic hemiplegia and spastic diplegia by far. Um, over two thirds of children with cerebral palsy experience spasticity and um, it's either hemiplegic or diplegic. And then there's a, uh, a smaller number that experience spastic quadriplegia. So again, when you add all of those up, you have nearly three quarters of children who have spastic cerebral palsy that affects either one side of the body or all four limbs. Um, we do see dystonia or apoptosis in about 10 to 15% of children. Again, that's, that's that fluctuating tone that's um, involved in an area of the brain um, that's injured called the basal ganglia. Ataxia is that very discoordinated kind of movement, which is involved with um, area of the brain injured, um, the, cere the cerebellum. And then there can be a mixed form of cerebral palsy. Sometimes you'll see mixed spastic and dystonic. Um, that's a very low percentage. So again, the vast majority of children with CP you're going to see are going to have some form of spasticity, um, although you will occasionally maybe see children with dystonia or ataxia. Now, moving on to kind of more contemporary um, classification systems. So if you think about it, um, even if you say a child is spastic quadriplegic or spastic diplegic, that isn't really descriptive. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying my grandma had a stroke, right? That's kind of how it is to say a child has CP. Um, th that could mean a lot of things. That could mean you could see them walking around in the mall and you wouldn't even really know it because the deficits are so subtle or they've had a lot of recovery. Um, or it could mean that they are in a wheelchair and can't walk, talk, or eat, right? So there's a vast, there's kind of a vast array of function even within um, the classifications by body part and movement type. And so the gross motor function classification system um, was developed some years ago um, that really categorizes children with CP based on their functional movement. And so there's five levels. Um, level one is the least involved. Level five is the most involved or the most severe. And this tool has been highly studied and is very reliable and valid, particularly at school age and older. Um, and it's also, most importantly, it's stable over time. So here is um, just a page from it. And again, I know this is hard to read, so you know, don't necessarily worry about reading it, but I just want you to get a sense of the fact that the, the gross motor function classification system divides children by age, and then within those age bands describes the different levels. So if you're between your second and fourth birthday and you're a level three, um, you may W sit, but um, you may creep on your stomach. Um, you may pull to stand and walk short distances using a walker, right? And by your fourth to sixth birthday, you can sit in a regular chair and move in and out of your regular chair. You're still going to walk on, walk using a, a mobility device. And you may be transported for longer distances in a wheelchair. So this just gives you an example of each age band has a specific, um, has a sp specific description. So you can use this tool. You can go to your child's age and then read those descriptions and kind of figure out their level based on those descriptions. 
and this is another just kind of nice way um, to visualize it. It actually gives that um, visualization. And this is between kids between their 6th to 12th birthday. So you can see your kids with the level 1, I mean, they can um, run and jump and carry things up and down the stairs, but they probably are just a little bit slower and less coordinated than their peers. And then you can see that goes all the way down to kids in GMFCS level 3 are using wheelchairs and walkers. And level five, kids are going to be transported um, on their own. And so then there's all of these kind of levels in between. So this is just another way to kind of look at it visually. And what's really nice about this tool is not only does it give us a common language. So if I say to you a child is a GMFCS level three, that paints a much clearer picture of their function than if I just say to you this child has spastic diplegia. I mean, if you know they're a GMFCS level three, you know that they can probably sit but they probably need an assistive device to walk and they may require a wheelchair for longer distances. You know, th that's all inherent in that level three description. That's not inherent in the description of spastic diplegia. So that's an important reason um, that the GMFCS is so helpful. But another really critical thing about the GMFCS is it also has been shown to be very stable over time. And so that means children don't tend to change levels. So if I'm a level three when I'm five years old, I'm probably going to be a level three when I'm 12 years old. Um, if children change levels, which happens very rarely, they usually just change one level. And if anything, they often go down a level, which is probably less reflective of their function and more reflective of the fact that PTs are optimists and we want to we want to give kids the benefit of the doubt. So we may overestimate them early on. This figure here just kind of shows that. So it shows, um, you know, for our level one kids, their motor function. And this, this um, axis here is just it shows um, the gross motor function measure, which is a, a test of motor development, but their score. So kids who are level one, here's what their scores are. And um, kids that are level two, here's where their scores are. Kids that are level three, and so on and so forth. And so what you can really see is that kids of different GMFCS levels definitely tend to cluster around um, these very specific kind of um, you know, motor, this very specific kind of level of motor performance, but also that their skills kind of level off. So you can see kind of between the ages of five, really by five or six, but certainly by age eight, um, most children have reached 90% of their motor function. Now you might notice this little dip that happens here, um, kind of around puberty in particular. This is a really tricky time for kids with um, cerebral palsy. Um, Bones grow faster than muscles, and so we grow taller, and um, that has problems with coordination. That's why any adolescent kind of looks a little clumsy. And so when you add on muscle tone issues and stability issues on top of that, um, there can be and frequently is some loss of function around adolescents. Um, again, remembering that CP itself is not progressive, but because of all these other kind of factors, Thinking back to dynamical systems theory and how many different things impact development, there, there can be some drop off there. So again, reveals kind of some opportunities for interventions, particularly in the early years while motor skills are rapidly developing and then popping back in possibly in adolescent years to try to help prevent those, those areas of decline or manage them. So some common impairments in cerebral palsy um, Muscle tone and extensibility is huge. As you noted in the earlier slide, the vast majority of children with cerebral palsy have high tone and spasticity. Um, even though that tone and spasticity makes muscles seem tight and often that um, can be um, mistaken as strength, um, the underlying strength of the muscles are actually very uh, low. So muscle strength is an issue. Um, skeletal structure can be an issue. So the because um, as we develop, our bones and joints often develop as a result of movement and weight bearing and kind of our typical movement patterns when kids don't have the opportunity to stand and weight bear and move in that typical pattern, um, bones can form differently. So we may have some um, issues with our hips and feet and different things. Um, selective control, postural control, and motor learning can be an issue. So we need to work on, um, you know, kind of motor planning, motor learning, giving kids lots of practice, developing that postural control so they can have good distal mobility. And pain is often an issue for individuals with cerebral palsy. And here is a um, nice handout that's got all kinds of associated videos uh, from the Pathways Awareness Foundation. 
And this just kind of gives you that um, comparison of a typical versus infant at four months old versus a child with cerebral palsy at four months old. And you can see kind of some of these red flags that we sometimes see. So asymmetries, um, unable to move against gravity. So, you know, look how his legs are flopped out to the side. That high tone, you see some extension. You know, you can just see this baby just looks kind of tighter, harder to move, difficulty with head control, isn't able to shift weight backwards. So all of these things can be some red flags for motor delays and kind of point us towards wondering about cerebral palsy. And huge one is asymmetries and those that difference in tone. If a baby feels tight or their, their movements are asymmetrical, that's definitely a red flag to look at. So interventions, um, we're gonna, in infancy, we're gonna educate families and caregivers on optimal development. We're gonna teach them handling and positioning. We're gonna do tons of tummy time. And we're just gonna help with positioning and um, showing parents how to hold their baby and use toys and, um, and the environment to just facilitate optimal sensory motor development. In preschool, um, we're going to start to look at preventing secondary impairments. So we want to look at all of those. Um, you know, we want to pay attention to how they're moving and the different postures so that they don't end up having pain or those um, bony deformities we talked about. We want to promote play and self-care. So those are huge things that start to develop in all children in preschool, and we don't want our kiddos to miss out on those opportunities. So our interventions should be, you know, working on toilet training and, you know, washing hands and playing with peers. And if they aren't able to do those things, we're helping create adaptations. Of course, we want to optimize gross motor skills. We want to work on all those gross motor skills and we want to promote mobility. So we want to help kids move um, in any way that they can because mobility equals sociability. So if that means, you know, power chairs and walkers or, you know, teaching them, you know, different strategies. We want to do what we can to promote independent mobility, even if that isn't, doesn't look like walking yet. And so moving on to school age, you know, most children reach their optimal gross motor function at early ages. Think back to that GMFCS um, Curve, those GMFCS curves that I showed you. So improvement is possible for some adolescents. I'm not at all trying to suggest that you can't gain skills and improve, but in general, PT at this age is gonna focus on maintenance and age-appropriate participation. So trying to prevent that kind of loss in function that we often see in adolescents. Um, challenges that specifically occur as children get to school age and adolescents, growth and puberty have a huge impact on movement. Um, pain becomes more common loss of muscle extensibility, which um, often kind of, I think, interacts with growth in puberty because again, as those bones start to grow, um, the muscle extensibility becomes problematic. Um, overuse injuries, and frankly, just a more demanding lifestyle. As you get older, as all of us get older, our world gets bigger. The school is bigger. We do more community events. There are now school dances and after school activities. Uh, we may even be looking at, you know, an after school job or, you know, going to the mall to hang out after school, those social functions. And so, you know, frankly, even if the, the child's skills haven't changed, the child himself hasn't changed, their world has changed. And so we may end up trying to implement some more creative strategies and adaptations and assistive devices to sort of, um, manage that bigger world and that more demanding life. And so um, this is all we have for today. Thank you for listening and I will see you next time.